Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Think Grow podcast, where personal development meets real life. I'm your host, Ruben Chavez, and normally I explore a variety of topics with thought leaders, creators, scientists, researchers, artists, entrepreneurs, all sorts of interesting people with the goal to bring you different perspectives you can use to enrich your mind and improve your life in whatever way you see fit. Today, I still want to bring you some perspectives that will enrich your mind, but I will be talking with you one-on-one. I wanted to talk with you about a principle that has made a big impact on my life and that I think will be really useful to you And I want to try to articulate that in a way that is clear and that you can apply to your life. So I I wanted to start off by first addressing the fact that I have been fairly inactive on social media for the past few weeks, let's say, probably more than that. Um, I've been posting, but it's been a little bit uh, less often. And the reason is because I've been working on my book. So if you follow Think, Grow, Prosper, and you've been like, hey, man, what's going on? That's what's going on. I have been in deep work trying to hammer out this this book that that I really want to get finished as soon as possible. That's what's going on there. I will say that the writing process is helping me to formulate some ideas that I think will be quite helpful for many of you. So I'm very excited to share it with you. In fact, that's partly why I'm doing this podcast, so I can share this idea with you that I've been writing about one of the ideas that I've been writing about. Okay, so back to kind of social media. Something that I need to get better at is documenting my process. I realized this. You know, I said that I hadn't posted for a while, and and that's true, but I have been working still, and it might be nice, you might enjoy it, if you got to see some of the the behind-the-scenes parts of that work, that writing process. And I realize that. So I'm making a commitment to get better at that. In the spirit of documentation, what I wanted to do partly in this podcast is go over my kind of my daily routine and and how I've enabled myself to write consistently because I haven't, I haven't written consistently for my entire uh, life, for my entire writing career. It's not something that's been a constant, but in, in the past really few months, I've, since baby has been born, I would say, I have, um, I have developed a daily structure that has enabled me to write more consistently and write better. And some of you have asked how I structure my day. So I want to briefly share some of that. And then I want to talk about this principle that ties in with, with the idea of setting up your day in such a way that you're able to do what you want to do. By the way, about daily routines, I know that they've been talked about a lot and they're kind of trendy, or at least they were trendy. Um, I don't like to be trendy. That's not what my goal is with anything that I do. What you do in terms of your routine, like how, how you set it up and the specifics about how you go about your day are not as important as the fact that you actually have a routine. That's something that I want to make clear. So I'm going to share with you kind of how I approach my day and how it's helped me, but know that you need to figure out what works best for you and optimize your routine in in a way that, that works best for you. But the point is to actually have structure, not that my structure is the best one. Oh, by the way, I, I've been using a an app called Productive, I believe that's what it's called, to track my habits and to and to make sure and keep me accountable to my daily routine. So I wanted to pop that in there. That's not an ad, um, or I'm not sponsored by the the app, but I did want to mention that because it's been a really useful app for me. Okay, so my routine, I optimize my daily routine personally for cognitive health and and mental clarity, I would say. 
those are really important to me. But it turns out <laughs> that all this stuff is basically the same stuff you'd want to do if you were trying to, you know, uh, just become generally healthier or lose weight or, you know, like gain muscle even or sleep better. It's all kind of connected and there's a lot of overlap. So these are just principles of kind of healthy living, I'd say. Very basic, but that's kind of what I shoot for. So the first thing is I wake up early. And I really don't have a choice now because I have a very cute alarm clock whose name is little Ruben, Rubencito, we call him. And he wakes me up between 5.30 and 6 every day. This is my, my seven-month-old. So sometimes, very rarely, I get up before him and sneak in a little work. That's when I do my best thinking, by the way, is when I'm alone and the world is quiet, although this doesn't happen quite, quite as often anymore. But I get up early and that really sets the tone for the day. While we're dressing him and, and Vanessa will likely be changing his diaper, what I'll do is I'll oil pull. Now you might say, Ruben, what the heck is oil pulling? And that's a good question. I do this before I brush my teeth. And basically what it is, is I swish with coconut oil for about 20 minutes. That sounds really gross. I realize that now that I'm saying it out loud. But it it is uh, an ancient dental hygiene practice that comes from Ayurvedic medicine. And it, it helps remove, it, it, it's useful for a variety of reasons. It helps remo- remove oil-soluble toxins from your gums. Um, it removes stains on your teeth. I personally do it for the anti-gum disease benefit. It, it turns out that uh, I was reading this book recently called uh, The End of Alzheimer's. Again, I'm obsessed with cognitive functioning and making sure I'm sharp and clear and, and preventing any kind of things that could obstruct that. But in this book, and, and, I, and I've read this in different sources, some, sometimes your, the bacteria from your gums can seep into your bloodstream and that can actually affect your cognition. They've, I think they found, like in Alzheimer's patients, they've, they've found um, this, this bacteria from your gums and sometimes from your nasal passages and stuff. If you're not, if you're not hygienic enough and if you have some sort of bacterial imbalance, it'll show up in your brain. So that's no bueno at all. That's partly why I oil pull just to make sure that I am, my mouth is very healthy, very balanced, very clean. And then I brush my teeth, of course. Okay. The next thing I do is, but by the way, I don't do every single one of these every single day. Um, Oil pulling, I probably do three times a week. Okay. The next thing I do is exercise. This is extremely important. The number one thing that you can do for your cognitive health is to exercise regularly. The research on that is very clear. And so that's really my primary reason for exercising is because I like to feel mentally sharp. Um, When I was a young whippersnapper, I used to just want to build muscle and look really good. And the cool thing is that's a side benefit still, but I, I really exercise for mental clarity at this point. So I break my exercise up into two kind of separate parts. There's the cardio portion of it, and then there's then there's the kind of resistance training or calisthenics portion of it. I used to go to the gym. I no longer go to the gym. I do uh, calisthenics training, which is just body weight exercise essentially. But the first thing I do is is we go for a hike usually. Vanessa and the baby and I go for a little morning hike. And we walk up this trail near our house. I run up the hill. I run back. I do some sprinting with baby on my back. He's in this little backpack. It's hilarious. I'm going to post some photos of that on stories here and put it on my highlight on my Instagram page, Think Girl Prosper. So if you're curious, you can check that out. Um, but he loves it. He has a blast. And I get exercise. We all get some fresh air. It's wonderful. And then after... After we we come back, we'll play with baby a little bit, and then I'll do some some uh, muscle training. I'll do some strength training. That might be some pull ups. It might be some push ups. I have different equipment at my house that enables me to do these kind of calisthenic 
uh, exercises. And sometimes baby will watch me and that's really cute. So that's my exercise routine. That's kind of where I put it. I do it first thing in the morning or as early as possible to get my blood flowing and get that blood into my brain. And I really feel that the days that I exercise are the days that I think the most clearly. So I try to exercise every day. I take maybe one or two days off generally. The next thing on the list is a cold shower. I take a very cold shower, a very brief one, but a very cold one. And I know there's been several people who've been talking about this lately. And again, it's kind of trendy. This is just something that I've found to be extremely useful for waking up my nervous system. And there seems to be a number of other health benefits associated with uh, kind of shocking your body with this, with cold water. I think the underlying principle there is that stress, or at least a, a moderate amount of stress, tends to make you stronger. And this is actually true biologically, physiologically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, if you think about it. So that's a principle worth thinking about. Stress strengthens. So I take a cold shower. That wakes me up. I do that about maybe four times a week, especially on days when I'm I'm writing. When I'm going to write for long periods of time, that will wake up my nervous system in a very effective way. Okay, the next thing I do is I sit down to write. At this point, uh, baby is taking a nap and Vanessa is usually watching him or napping with him, not actually napping with him, but holding him or uh, or doing some other chores. And I will write. This is, ha- this is happening around 9 a.m. or so. And I'm working on my book. That's what I'm doing. That's my number one priority at this point in in my life is to finish this book and to get my thoughts out there. I'm learning a lot through the writing process, by the way. It's, it's, it's incredible how many questions, how many of your own questions you tend to answer when you're, you're writing because writing is essentially indistinguishable from thinking. In order to write clearly, you have to think clearly. clearly. You have to hone your, your thought process and you have to you know, separate the wheat from the chaff in, in a sense. You have to discard bad ideas and... and uncover the the good ones. And so I've been doing that almost every day. I've started, I I would say that I've stopped and started my book, I don't know, 700 times, (laughs) at least it feels like. Um, I mean, I I think I calculated it and I've written about 30 to 40,000 words, but actually I've discarded about 30 to 40,000 words. I've probably... I probably have about eight to 10,000 words that are actually usable. So anyway, but it's a process and I finally feel like this draft that I'm on now is starting to become something really useful. Excited to share it with you. Okay, so next thing on the list is uh, my first meal of the day, which is breakfast. And that is breaking my fast. I, I I actually do a loose intermittent fasting schedule. Some of you may have heard of intermittent fasting. This is essentially where you give yourself an eating window during the day and you don't eat outside of that window. There's a number of health benefits associated with it. I'm most interested in autophagy, which is the process of cell renewal, particularly my brain cells. But there's a number of, of other health benefits associated with, with intermittent fasting. But anyway, I usually um, eat around 10 o'clock. We sit down as a family to eat. Uh, baby will have his food and I'll make breakfast for the family generally. Um, before I have my first meal, I like to eat a high probiotic food of some sort like sauerkraut or kimchi on an empty stomach because that allows those good probiotics, that good bacteria to implant themselves in my gut more effectively. Okay, so just a note on the first meal. My first meal, I've played with many different foods and combinations of of different types of foods and combinations of foods for breakfast over the years. And I've just found that I do best with a high protein, zero carbohydrate, moderate fat, high vegetable meal in the morning. So basically protein and veggies is is really my sweet spot in the morning. That helps stabilize my blood sugar throughout the day. And if you're wondering what foods work best for you and what foods you 
um, agree with your metabolism the best, I, I would I would try the the three different macronutrients. Try eating one of the three different macronutrients first thing in the morning. So first day have a fat, the second day have a carbohydrate, and the third day have a protein, and and nothing else. And see which day you feel better. For me, I could have pro- I could have just protein in the morning and I feel great for, for the next few hours. So that's what I do. I cannot eat any carbs in the morning, even good ones, even slow carbs. They throw me off completely. Sometimes I'll have sweet potatoes and that seems to work well for me. I love sweet potatoes. But find what works for you. That would be my um, advice. Uh, next thing I do is take my supplements. Again, my supplements are optimized for cognitive um, health, but they are useful for a variety of other health reasons. I take a very simple stack of supplements. I take omegas, omega threes. Um, I take uh, a little ashwagandha in the morning. I, I take a a basic whole food multivitamin, which is just like actual whole green foods that are compacted into a vitamin. That's pretty much it. So I'll, I'll take zinc too. I, I do well with zinc supplementation. Okay, so after I've got my nutrition and my exercise squared away and my nervous system is woken up, I will clean up the kitchen and do some miscellaneous house chores while baby kind of takes his, you know, gets ready for his his second nap. Maybe I'll play with baby for for a little bit or Vanessa and I will will do some, you know, have some discussions about work if we need to. And then the next part of my day is about metacognition or kind of working on my my mind or my brain health. And these are some exercises that I do. I do three different exercises that that really help me with my cognitive functioning, let's say. The first one is I juggle. And juggling, it's been a while since I've looked at the... <laughs> the uh, exact benefits of, of juggling, but I believe it increases the white matter in your brain, which is responsible for carrying neural information. And so the more white matter in your brain, the faster your reaction time and the faster you can process things. I believe it's something like that. Uh, but juggling does does increase, um, or juggling does positively impact your cognition. Okay, so I'll juggle for a few minutes and I don't do all three of these every day, but these are the three that I kind of rotate in and out. The next thing I do is I play brain games. Now, I don't play any, just any old brain games because I know that there's some controversy over if brain games are actually useful or if they're just kind of, you know, uh, making you better at brain games. Posit Science has an app called um, Brain HQ, I believe. Again, this is not a paid advertisement. It is just a, an app that I, I love and that actually has the most research behind it and it has the most well-studied and effective games that have been shown to in- improve your cognition in a variety of, of ways. So Brain HQ is a really good is a really good app. It has dozens of games that you can play and you can set it up to where it, it uh, reminds you to, to play and you also can kind of increase the difficulty as you as you need to. So that's a really fun app and one that I've actually seen great benefit from. In fact, the days that I write the most successfully are the days when I play brain games. So that's something that I noticed recently. Okay, and then the third thing I do is meditate. This is really you know, these are all kind of meta, meta cognition exercises in that they, they help overall cognition, but, um, meditation is no different. So meditation is very, very useful in helping you to center your mind, helping you to concentrate throughout your day, um, helping to clear the clutter from your, the, of the mental noise from your mind you don't need to do anything fancy. Just sit in a chair or sit on the floor, or sit on the edge of your bed, wherever you, you find yourself and be quiet. Close your eyes for 10, 15 minutes and just focus on breathing. Focus on your bodily experiences. Focus on the sensations you're experiencing at the moment. There's a variety of ways to do meditation, but that's roughly how I approach it. You don't need to overthink it though. 
Okay, so those are the three kind of brain slash mind exercises that I do. It's important to remember that just like your muscles, your brain needs to be challenged in order to keep it functioning optimally. So challenge your brain and work on your brain, exercise your brain. Again, stress strengthens. So a little bit of struggle for your brain is actually quite useful. The other part of my day, I think, that may be useful for some people is the evening routine. Uh, The evening routine is when I I really wind down. I try not to look at screens. If I do look at screens, I have anti-blue light glasses that I wear. The evening is when I read, you know, catch up on my reading or studying. If I'm taking a course of some sort, I'll do it then. And then I really just try to go to bed early, like before before 10 is kind of the goal, or by 10 rather is is the goal. And sometimes I will take a sleep supplement. Sometimes it'll be magnesium, sometimes it'll be melatonin, uh, sometimes it'll be a little ashwagandha. All three of those facilitate good deep sleep. I want to take a brief moment to talk about one of our sponsors for this show, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 25,000 classes in pretty much any field you can think of. Writing, photography, uh, cooking, even social media marketing, just to name a few. One of the many reasons that I love and promote Skillshare is because their core values of learning and growing are very much in alignment with my own and I'm sure if you're listening to this with yours too. I'll tell you about one of my favorite classes that I've ever taken with Skillshare. It was a productivity masterclass and it was all about creating systems in your life and business. And it was taught by this pretty well-known YouTuber and it completely changed how Vanessa and I run our business. It helped give us our time back by helping us to create systems that streamlined and organized our content creation and our editorial calendar for Finger Girl Prosper massively, massively helpful. And here's the cool news. Right now, Skillshare is offering listeners of the Think Grow podcast two months free, so you can try it out for yourself. Go to Skillshare.com slash Think Grow. You'll get unlimited access to 25,000 classes for a full two months at no cost. So it's basically a risk-free situation here. The specific URL that you want to visit for this offer is skillshare.com slash thinkgrow. Check it out. Join the millions of other students who are learning and growing with Skillshare. I've used it for a while. I love it. I think you will too. Again, that URL is skillshare.com slash thinkgrow. And now, back to the show. That's my day. I spent a little bit too long on that, but... I think you get the idea. The the point I want to make, the larger point that I think is more important is that structure is vital. Here's, Here's a principle that I've been trying to clarify in my writing, and and I'll try to explain it here for you, but it ties in with, with what with the daily routine idea. And the principle is constraints enable. What does that mean? Well, let's back up a bit. Actually, this is part of a a larger meta principle that I'm writing about called maintain balance. Maintain balance is, it has to do with the fact that most things in life are a matter of striking the right balance between opposing forces to establish some sort of harmony. So virtually everything in life requires balance to function properly. To a degree, this is kind of self-evident. For example, you know, we need to balance work with rest. Otherwise, we're going to eventually burn out and not be able to work, right? So that's a fairly simplistic and obvious example. But there are all sorts of ways that this idea manifests. Some of them are not so obvious. But I want to talk about one that is relevant to this topic of of daily structure. And what that is, is the balance between freedom and restriction. So let me explain that a little bit more. We think we want absolute freedom, but actually we don't. Unbridled freedom leads to overwhelm, it leads to chaos, it leads to analysis paralysis. So 
under circumstances of abundant or excessive freedom, actually the counterbalancing force that enables you to do what you need to do is constraint. Another way of putting this is that freedom in any area of life is only desirable if it's counterbalanced by some form of constraint. What are constraints? Constraints are any restrictions or limitations that provide structure or purpose or clarity or direction. This is similar to the idea that you may have heard put forth by Jocko Willink. Jocko Willink is a retired Navy SEAL. He has a podcast, great podcast, and he, he's written um, a few books. One of them is Extreme Ownership. But he talks about this idea that discipline is freedom. And that's that's roughly what we're talking about here. Constraints, although they sound like something you don't want, they're actually quite useful, especially in an environment where you have an abundance of options. So in such an environment, constraints are useful because they decrease complexity. That's how they help maintain balance. That's why this principle is so relevant in today's world where there are are so many options and so many distractions and the potential for becoming overwhelmed is extremely high. Now, of course, constraints enable only to a certain point. Past this point, restriction is no longer freedom, but oppression. This brings us back to the idea of balance. That's why constraints enable because we're talking about an environment of absolute freedom or of, of ex, uh, an excess of options. But going too far in any one direction takes us off course. That's kind of the point. It's, it's the tension between the opposing energies that drives progress, essentially. So here are just a few other examples of how constraints enable and a few more domains in which this principle um, appears. One of those domains is creativity. In any creative project, innovation and true uh, imagination and creativity comes from constraints. Like this is what the, the saying necessity is the mother of invention points to. When you're limited in some way, you become more inventive in order to compensate for the limitation. And when it comes to creativity, if you feel as though you can do anything or that you have all the time and all the resources in the world, that seems desirable at first. But in fact, the opposite is true. Too much time and too many resources is actually paralyzing. And it's a little overwhelming. It's a little daunting. And it just turns out that if you look at the the great artists of, of history and the people who have invented incredible things, it turns out that complete creative freedom is not the force that produces great art or leads to creativity, but rather it's limitation is the force. Limitation is the force that actually leads to innovation and uh, creativity. The artist needs something to rebel against, something to give her work direction and purpose and meaning. And the more constraints to a degree that the artist has, the more creative and inventive he or she needs to be in order to produce that great work. Here's a quote from Andrei Tarkovsky, who was considered one of the greatest directors of the 20th century. He said, an artist never works under ideal conditions. If they existed, his work wouldn't exist, for the artist doesn't live in a vacuum. Some sort of pressure must exist. The artist exists because the world is not perfect. Art would be useless if the world were perfect, as man wouldn't look for harmony, but would simply live in it. And that kind of sums up this, this idea in the creative domain. Now, when it comes to your daily routine or how you approach your day or how you structure your day, constraints also enable. Because imagine that you were unemployed and you didn't have anywhere to be. You had no commitments. You had no social engagements. You had nothing on your calendar. That sounds... Maybe it might sound to you that that would be desirable, that that would be uh, a good thing. That would get old very quickly. And in fact, you would become the 
uh, prototypical image of the spacey and unstructured and slovenly kind of pothead who just sits around all day and, and does nothing and gets nothing accomplished because there's no structure and because there's no constraints. And in fact, that could devolve into something even worse very quickly. So far from holding us back, constraints in our daily life actually help us to be more productive, more efficient, and more effective. So anything that structures your day for you is effectively a constraint. This includes things like scheduling priorities. It includes your routines, your habits, and and everything like that. So let's take scheduling priorities, for example. Scheduling your priorities rather than prioritizing whatever's on your schedule is an effective way to structure your day. It's basically identifying the mission critical activities for the day and saying, okay, I have to complete these. These are the things that I have to complete during the day. And however my day looks, it has to structure itself in such a way that these things get done. So that's a very useful constraint for for your day and and an easy one to implement. Another thing is just a simple daily routine, like, like something that I laid out for you earlier in the podcast. It's useful to have a routine and a, a regular set of activities that you do every day, not just for psychological stability and a sense of order, but also because it gives you the discipline to fit what it is that you want to fit into your day. Like here's a here's a funny example. Have you ever gotten to the end of uh, like a Sunday evening and realized that you kind of wasted the entire day doing nothing? Like you felt that pit in your stomach and you're like, oh man, I really could have done more today. It's probably because you didn't have any constraints to organize your day. You felt like you could do anything, right? You were off work and... You, you had the whole day to, to yourself, but you ended up doing nothing paradoxically. And if you flip that around, if you actually, if you actually structure your day and, and include constraints in your day, you'll get more done. Research shows actually that people who have a consistent daily routine are less depressed and, and more well adjusted in general. And this is extremely true, uh, for children. Children thrive off of routine and structure. The objection to this might be something like, well, I'm an artist and I don't I don't wanna feel restricted. I only work when I feel inspired. A, a daily routine would kill my creativity. And to that I say, it, it's a reasonable objection because it feels like you, would, you wouldn't need restriction. But I'm, I'm telling you the Creative people, the most creative people in the world schedule time every day to be creative. Virtually every accomplished writer or, or artist sits down at some point in the day at a predetermined point, uh, whether they feel inspired or not, and works. Th- this is something that Stephen Pressfield says, the author of The uh, War of Art. He says, the artist doesn't wait for inspiration. She acts in anticipation of its apparition. Essentially, inspiration shows up only when you do. Another form of constraints are habits. So habits are a form of routine, which is a form of constraint. The adoption of habits decreases complexity and it decreases our need to use mental energy to make decisions. This is why people like Steve Jobs and Barack Obama and others uh, deliberately limited their wardrobe options during their professional career because it's one less thing to think about. Steve Jobs wore a black turtleneck, you know, and he, he just had, that's what he wore. That was his uniform. So he had, he, that was one less decision he had to make. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, Barack Obama had a similar um, approach. He had like a limited number of suits that he, that he rotated. So um, that's just another way, another constraint you can add to your day to decrease complexity and decrease mental energy. The research in the book Paradox of Choice shows that few, the fewer options we have to choose from, actually the happier we are. So this is something to consider as well. Another con- another kind of constraint is a time constraint. And if, you're, if you've ever read uh, The 4-Hour Work Week, which I highly recommend, Tim Ferriss really popularized this idea of Parkinson's Law. And what that is essentially is that a task will expand 
in proportion to the time that you allot for it. So if you say, if you give yourself, you know, let's say two days to do a particular um, research paper, let's say to write a paper, it'll, it'll take you the full two days. But if you constrain that time to, let's say, half a day, or, you know, six, you have five hours to complete it, uh, you'll also tend to get it done within that time period. And so that's a constraint, but it enables you to get more work done, do what you need to do. My wife has, has told me that when she was in college, she was the most productive she's ever been. She had a full class schedule in college and she she also did um, kind of some extracurricular activities and she had a very full social life. She did some volunteer work and and it's the most productive she's ever been because she had such a busy schedule that she had to that she that she had to essentially be more efficient with her time. And so this is kind of the same idea. Just a couple more here to really drive this point home because I think this is very, very important. This principle shows up in all sorts of domains. I'm mainly talking about kind of the personal development domain here, but it, it really does expand into different areas. Finances is one of those areas. So a budget is essentially a constraint, right? Like you're assigning a purpose to every dollar and you're constraining your spending in a sense. Unconstrained budgets lead to financial ruin, which ultimately and paradoxically limits your freedom. And this is why the majority of lottery winners end up broke. And this is statistically verifiable. Like I think there's books written on this. But it's also why so many celebrities, especially young celebrities who are, who are very new and, and who it happens to very quickly engage in kind of destructive behavior and go down a this it's kind of spiral out of control because they have virtually unlimited money they have unlimited privilege and unlimited freedom they have no constraints and in that type of environment if you're not balancing your life with some sort of constraint that freedom will ruin you it becomes destructive and so by let's say creating a budget you constrain your finances and you set up a sense and you instill a sense of order in your in your spending and in your financial life so that's that's another area where constraints enable you know in finances constraints enable you to save they enable you to spend money on what you want to spend money on they enable you to not go broke so those are a few ideas for you to chew on I would say another thing to think about is, in general, problems, the problems we face and the annoyances that pop up in our daily lives are also a form of constraint. And you can look at them as constraints in order to move past them more creatively. If you look at a problem as a sort of constraint that you have to work within or overcome or be creative about solving... It'll be much, you'll be much more productive and you'll deal with that problem much more effectively than if you view it as a nuisance. So there's a big difference between constraints and nuisances and constraints are actually useful and drive progress. So the idea is to leverage those constraints, leverage those limitations in a way that works for you, set up daily structures, set up habits set up a budget, constrain yourself so you can have the most freedom and enable yourself to do what it is that you want to do. Hey, thanks for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode and all other episodes on my website at thinkgrowprosper.com slash podcast. That's where I put all the links and resources mentioned in each episode. It's also where I put the outlines of topics covered, which is a really good way to refer back to episodes in the future. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love to hear about it. Feel free to leave a review on iTunes with your biggest takeaway. I make it a point to read all the reviews. 
You can also screenshot this episode and share it to your social media along with something you learned or found interesting. And tag me in your post because I'd love to see what you found interesting. Say hi and thank you for your support. 